So we just want to introduce and explain what, what do we mean by data communications and uh, talk a little bit about some examples of communication links and networks. What, do we, what is data communications? We, when we're communicating, what we're doing is sharing information. That is, when I'm talking to you or lecturing to you, then the idea is that I'm giving information to you. When we're talking face to face, that's local sharing, local communications. Of course, we can share across a large distance. Many of the examples of computer communications is sharing information across a a large distance, for example across the globe, between cities and so on. Sometimes we'll use different techniques depending upon the distance at which we want to communicate. So communications sharing information. Data is the information being shared. And the common forms of data or information we want to share are text, files, numbers, images, audio and video. So they are examples of data that we want to share. We're going to focus of course on computer communications between computer devices, not between humans. So data communications can be defined as the exchange of data between two or more devices via some transmission medium. So exchange of data such as text, images, video, two or more devices we need at least two. We're sharing between one and another. In fact, we can share between multiple, more than two devices. The most common example we think of, of communications is I send from one computer to another. Okay? That's two devices. Maybe we have a link, a cable between one and another. But it's possible to share between multiple devices. That is, one device transmits and multiple devices receive. So although many examples we use and think of who have just two devices communicating, one to another, we can have one to many communications. So between two or more devices. Exchange of data between two or more devices via some transmission medium. The transmission medium is the thing between the devices. If I connect my laptop to this PC via a cable and that cable has copper wires, then that's the transmission medium. We transmit the data across some medium. So in general, we can select different types of medium, media. So we will look and have one topic about different examples of transmission media, wired, like a LAN cable, wireless, my laptop to the access point using wireless transmission, and different types of wires, copper wires, optical fiber, coaxial cable are three examples. So that's what we mean by transmission, a transmission medium, the thing between the transmitter and receiver. So we want to share information between computing devices. How do we do that in an effective manner is one thing we're going to focus on in this course. Well, what do we mean by effective? What is it when our communications works well? How do we measure that? Three main metrics, three main measures for effective data communications. Delivery, accuracy and timeliness. If I'm sending data from one computer to another, that data needs to be delivered to the correct destination. That's almost obvious. If I send it to someone who it's not intended to, then that's ineffective communications. It's bad. It doesn't work well. When I send data, the data that's received should be an accurate copy of what was originally sent. I send from my computer to a web server on the other side of the world. What my computer sent and what that web server received should be the same. If they're different, then we could consider that as inaccurate communications. It's ineffective. And timeliness. The data should arrive at the receiver on time, within some reasonable time. A simple example of those three metrics 
not in terms of computer communications, you'll want to communicate with someone you have, you want to show your affection to some other person, okay? You want to send them a message and tell them how you feel. You write them an email and you write, I love you in the email. And you type in the destination address and you press send. And it goes to someone else, okay? Your email destined to one person goes to someone else. That's ineffective communications. It hasn't been delivered to the correct destination. The consequences of that can be significant. So in this case, we want the data to be sent to the right destination. If it's not, I think it's obvious that it's not good. So that's about delivery. You write this email. Maybe it gets sent to the right destination. You write an email, I love you. Send to the right destination. Send across the internet this email. Something goes wrong in the internet. Some of the words get changed and it arrives as I hate you. Okay? Here we have inaccurate delivery. What is received is not an accurate representation of what was sent. And of course that's ineffective communications. We haven't achieved what we're trying to achieve. Other one, you send your email, I love you. The email arrives one year later. The other person has gone and got married. It hasn't arrived on time and therefore we've got ineffective communication. So these are three main metrics we use to determine whether our communication system works well or not, if it's effective. Some of the things that you probably used or techniques that uh, you've seen which are related to these. Delivery in the internet, for example, to deliver information to the right destination, we need addresses. You have email addresses. They identify your email box. We have domain names, www.facebook.com. When I type in facebook.com into my browser, it tells my browser the destination server that I want to send data to. So addressing is a key part of accurate delivery. And there are other mechanisms involved as well. What about accuracy? Accurate delivery depends upon the data. How do we measure accuracy? An email, if I compose an email, I type in the words, press send, what is received at the recipient's computer should be an identical copy to what I typed in. Okay? The words should not be changed. That would be accurate. If there was a spelling mistake, for some reason I typed in some words and different words arrived at the receiver, that's inaccurate. So it needs to be an exact copy of what was sent. Well what about your streaming a video from YouTube web server? You've got your laptop, you visit the YouTube website. How that works is that on the server somewhere at YouTube's uh, premises, they have the video. Okay? And with streaming video, they just send you the video. So this is data communications. They're sending the video from the server to your laptop and you're viewing the video on your laptop. With video and audio communications, it's possible that even if what is received by your computer is different from what the original video was, you can still make sense of the video. video. You can still watch it and it will still be considered accurate. For example, you're watching a video, it's high quality at the server, it's being sent but there are errors in the network such that some portion of the video is lost, it doesn't get to your laptop. You may not notice that when you play back the video. Maybe it's just one pixel in the far left corner, or the top left corner, that is the wrong colour. Displayed for a fraction of a cent a second, you would not notice that. Your eyes would not notice if there's one pixel wrong. If there is hundreds of pixels in the video wrong, wrong colour, and for a long period of time, you'll start to notice that when you play back the video. Okay? So, in terms of video, sending video or audio across the network, even if what is received is not exactly the same as what was sent, we still consider it accurate. 
So with some types of data, accuracy means the receiver gets exactly the same as what was sent. With other types of data, it doesn't have to be the case. We can tolerate some differences. So accuracy depends upon the data that we're sending. How do we measure it? Well, uh, it depends upon the data and the application. We'll see some examples of that uh, in some later topics. Similar with timeliness depends upon the application. You send an email uh, to your friend. What time do you expect that email to take to get to the destination? Anyone? Give me a number. How long do you... Are you willing to wait for your email to reach the destination? Hmm? Three seconds, several seconds. What if the email arrived one min minute later? You type in send, your friend gets it one minute later. Is that okay? Would you be upset? No, that's okay. One minute. I think with email, sometimes the delay may be several minutes. So you press send. In many cases, it's seconds. In some cases, it's minutes. In bad cases, if there's some problem in the network, you could receive an email hours after it was sent, even days in the worst cases. So in email, the time from when it was sent and received is in the order of seconds up to hours even. What about you using MSN or an instant messaging application, a chat application? You type in some message, press enter, sends a message to your friend. How long can you tolerate of a delay? If you're using instant messaging, MSN, a chat application, how long do you think it should take to get the message to the other person? Se two seconds, several seconds. Instant messaging, sending messages instantly to the other person. Instant means order of seconds. If I'm using a chat application and I press enter and it takes two minutes to get that message to the other person, then the application is not working correctly. So timeliness, timeliness depends upon the application. This is a problem with our video. Different applications have different requirements for what is reasonable time. We'll see some examples of them over the, the next few topics. So we want to share data between computing devices. We want that to be effective, delivered correctly, accurately, within a reasonable time. Often when we want to look at the problem of communications, we can consider the system as some model, some block diagram. Here's a simple model of communications. Five blocks. The first two blocks are part of the source system, the one that wants to send data, and the last two blocks are part of the destination system, the one that are going to receive data. And in the middle we have the transmission system, the thing that gets the data from source to destination. So a very simple view of communications. The source block generates data. So this is the thing that generates data, whether it's an application, a computer, some software. The source generates data. Maybe it's the application on my computer generates the data to send to a web server, so the web browsing application. It generates data. The transmitter, which is also in the source system, takes that data and converts it into a format that can be sent across our transmission system. And what we send across a transmission system is signals. So if my laptop wants to send to this computer, then my application and computer generate some data Inside my laptop, I have a transmitter. If I'm using the wired Ethernet, my, my LAN card has a transmitting device. If I'm using Wi-Fi, wireless LAN, I also have a wireless LAN transmitter. What it, the transmitter does, takes my data, normally represented as bits, zeros and ones, and creates some electromagnetic signal that we can send. Some electrical waveform, some radio signal, 
sends them some signal. The transmission system carries that signal from source to destination. The transmission system may be a single link. It may be a set of links, more complex. A receiver takes the signal that's received, converts it back to data. Let's say we receive some electrical signal, some waveform, we convert it back to bits, zeros and ones. Then the destination block consumes that data. It takes and uses the incoming data, maybe response. So just five basic components of a communications. Generate data, transmit that data by converting it to signals. Signals are sent across the transmission system. The receiver receives signals, converts it back to data, and the destination receives the data and does what it needs to do. So communications is simple, five blocks. An example, not this slide, an example maybe with my laptop. My laptop is connected to this wireless LAN access point on the wall. And when I want to send data, say access a website, what happens is my web browser generates some data to send. When I click on a link, it generates some data to send to a web server. The computer sends it through the operating system to the wireless LAN device on board my laptop. Inside my laptop there's a wireless LAN chip, a Wi-Fi chip. And that chip has a transmitter. What it does is it takes the data, which is just a sequence of bits from the transmitter's perspective, and converts those bits into a signal a radio signal that the antenna can propagate from my laptop up to the access point. So in terms of wireless, the transmitter takes bits and creates some radio signal. That signal propagates across the air. The transmission medium is the air in this case. And it reaches the antennas on the access point here. So some radio signal reaches the antennas. The antennas take that signal and the receiver inside the access point takes the receive signal and converts it back to bits, zeros and ones. And then we have the data at the access point. And then maybe the access point sends that data via a wired link. You can see just above the access point this, there's a cable. It goes up into the ceiling and eventually down to the third floor computer center and then out to the rest of the network. So similar, the access point can send that data as an si electrical signal across these copper wires to some device downstairs, which then sends it on and on to wherever the destination is. So across a single link, generate data, convert to a signal, transmit the signal, cross some transmission system, receive the signal, convert back to data. And we may do that across multiple links. That's data communications. Viewing it from that perspective, it looks simple. We have five blocks, convert data to signal, send, convert back to data. Simple. The problem is to do that effectively, for effective data communications, there are many different things involved to make that work well. The point of this slide really is that even though our five block communication model looks simple, to make it work well is very complex. There are many different tasks to achieve and some of them are listed here. There's an access point in this room, there's another one in the other lecture rooms and there's one out in the corridor and some downstairs. If I want to send to this access point, we need to have some form of addressing. I need to somehow indicate that my data goes to this access point and not to some other access point. So we need some addressing scheme. I need to generate the signals and transmit some signal. The process of generating signals, how do I do that? We have an entire topic on how to generate different signals or encode data as signals. So these are some tasks that we need to do to communicate across a link and a network. The point is that there are many tasks and each task is quite difficult. 
There are many different ways to do it, many different trade-offs to make. So communications can be quite complex. We need to provide security sometimes so that no one else can receive our data. We need to detect errors. If I send some bits and there are some errors in the transmission, I'd like to detect those errors and correct them if possible. So even if there's an error in the transmission system, if I send my message, I love you, we should be able to detect if the received message is wrong and automatically correct it so that the person at the receiver receives the same message as what I sent. So there are different ways of error detection and correction, which we'll cover towards the midterm. Communications is hard. And the next topic talks about how do we address all these problems by breaking this hard problem into multiple, smaller, easier problems to solve. And that's for next week. Today is just a very broad overview. I've talked about links I send from laptop to the access point. We can think of that as one link. Then the access point sends across the cable to some other device. That's another link. And then another device and it goes on and on. We can talk about communications across a single link and then across a set of links or a network of links. So we distinguish between data communications focusing on an individual links. How do we send data across one link? And then another topic is how do we join all those links together such that my data will go from my laptop to the Facebook web server in California across a network or across the internet? So we distinguish between data communications and networks. Let's look at some of the problems to solve for each of them. First, data communications. Here's our block model, a block diagram. Same as before, five blocks. Just a specific example. The source has some text, an email, for example, some text. It wants to send to the destination. We represent that text as bits. So we take the letters, say if it's in English, and convert them into binary. How do we do that? How do you convert the letter A, B and C into bits? What do you use to convert characters into binary? You would have come across it, maybe in programming. Yeah, and maybe the more common thing isn't there a table that shows you that the letter A maps to the number 37 or something? ASCII table, the ASCII character set. That's one way the ASCII character set says that this letter, letter A, I can't remember the number, maps to the decimal number, whatever it is, 36, which is represented as a 7-bit binary value. Okay? So that's our binary represent representation of a character. So given any text, we can convert it into bits. Same with a video. We can treat our data as binary, as zeros and ones. Our source generates data, which is viewed as a sequence of bits, or a stream of bits, one bit followed by another. The transmitter takes those bits, and in this example, converts into some analog signal. So if my email from my laptop needs to be sent to the wireless LAN access point on the wall. I have some bits. The wireless LAN transmitter inside my laptop takes those bits and creates some radio signal, some electromagnetic waves which propagate through the air. Propagate or carried by the transmission system to the receiver. The receiver does the opposite of converting the signal back into bits. That's the same as we've said before. Some problems or some more terminology. The link between transmitter and receiver we show here as a transmission system, but sometimes we'll refer it as a transmission link or transmission line. Because we think of it as a cable connecting source to destination. 
So that's key to the system. How do we connect source to destination? If we're using wires, what technology do we use? So we talk about a link between a transmitter and a receiver. I have a link from my laptop to the access point. That access point has a link via this cable to some network device downstairs. This PC has a link to some network device via this cable. Even if it's wireless, we still talk about a, a link. Even though we cannot see wires, it's a, a link. When we choose a technology for that link, the main things we care about are the capacity of that link, reliability and cost. I think some of you have probably seen the access points. This is a wireless LAN access point. You can communicate wirelessly to it, but it also has cables plugged into it. You can connect a LAN cable into it. I want to connect my laptop at home to the access point. I have two options. That's just to show that it's a wireless link. I can connect wirelessly from my laptop to the access point, or I can plug a cable in to my laptop a LAN cable and plug it into the access point. Which one's better? Say for your home network, which one's better? Use the wireless link or use the LAN cable, the wired link? Well, it depends. And different depending upon the user requirements. But three things that we, there are, there are more than three, but three things we uh, often see that are important are the capacity of the link, the reliability, and the cost. What's the capacity of a wireless link from a laptop to an access point? Anyone know or want to guess? Capacity. How much data can it carry? How many bits per second? Or even easier, how many megabits per second do you think a wireless LAN link can carry? Some of you may have seen the numbers and may not connect what they mean. You may see numbers, and it depends upon how expensive your device is. 54 megabits per second. Most, at least these access points, have a capacity of 54 million bits per second. That means, at maximum, I can send 54 million bits per every second from my laptop to the access point. That's what we call the capacity. How much data can we carry? The maximum amount of data can we carry? Because that's what we care about, getting data from source to destination. How fast can we do that? This is one measure of the capacity, or a common capacity of a wireless LAN link. Others, if you, uh, you may see this as referred as 802.11g, some may be 11N, which go up to 300 megabits per second. Depends on the device you buy. What about our wired link? You plug a cable in, what do you think the capacity of your wired link is? Anyone know? How fast can you send across a LAN cable? 100 what? 100 megabits per second is a common one. It depends upon the transmitter and receiver in the device. Most common is 100 megabits per second. Some, most laptops now support one gigabit per second, 1,000 megabits per second. Whether you use that depends upon whether the other device supports it. This access point does not support one gigabit per second. Some newer ones do. Okay? So it depends upon the devices. So that's capacity. How m how much data can we carry? Data measured in terms of bits and the speed at which we can carry it, so bits per second, whether it's megabits per second, kilobits per second, gigabits per second. So they have different capacities. When you choose the technology, you want to ask, what do I need? 
for my applications, what capacity is required? Am I going to be just web browsing? Well, 54 megabits per second is going to be fine, most likely. Am I streaming HD TV, multiple channels in parallel? High quality TV, most likely you're going to need possibly more than 54 megabits per second. Maybe you need wired network. So capacity is important. Reliability. Some technologies are more reliable than others. By that I mean that uh, a link would be less reliable if more errors occur. I send some data, it's received incorrectly at the receiver and therefore somehow we need to fix that. That's bad. You may notice, especially if you're streaming video, that wireless links are generally less reliable than wired links. So in terms of reliability, our wired link is probably better in this simple example. It depends upon the technology. Cost, which one's cheaper? They're both very cheap in terms of home technologies. To buy a device, an access point which supports just wireless LAN but not wired access, a cheap one is, I don't know, a thousand baht. To buy a device that supports just wired network but not wireless is probably 500 baht. All right, cheaper but not a substantial difference. To buy something that supports both is probably 1,200 baht. Again, not much different. They, they're in very cheap in this example. So the cost uh, doesn't differ much. If we want to compare now another technology and use optical fiber here, because we want higher reliability and capacity, maybe we want 10 gigabits per second, Optical fiber, now we're talking about costs of thousands, tens of thousands of baht to get a device that will support that. So different technologies have trade-offs in terms of capacity, reliability and cost. We will see some of those trade-offs in more detail when we look at different transmission media. Let's move along. We want to finish with uh, one or two examples in the last 15 minutes. So, the rest of this course, we're going to answer some of these questions. How do we convert information or data into some signal that can be transmitted? What is that signal? What transmission media do we use? Do we use wired or wireless? What type of wires do we use? Copper wires, optical fibres, which is glass or plastic fibres. What do we use as a transmission media? There are different options. If we use wireless, what frequency do we use? Do we transmit to the access point? Do we transmit to a satellite? So different options for different transmission media. How do we efficiently take our information and encode it as signals? Things like codecs and modems come into play here. I send some data. There are errors. We cannot avoid errors sometimes. How do we fix them? We want to be efficient when we use our link. How do we maximize the efficiency in using a link? Make more sense, sense once we get to lands, that one. We're going to answer them in later topics. That's about links. Just focusing how to get a data across one link via some signals. Once we have data across a link, we often want to connect multiple links together to form a network. How do we, or what are the issues that arise with networks? Let's look at three quick examples of different network technologies. Wide area networks, WANs. Local area networks, LANs. And the internet. What's a wide area network? A network that covers a large area. A large geographical area. We're talking about networks that cover across cities, between cities, between countries, and across the globe. You know, that's what generally when we refer to, or you hear wide area networks, that's the area we're talking about. SIT has a wide area network connecting this campus to the Rungsit campus. It's across a city, all right, 
across 10 or 15 kilometres. So that's considered a wide area network. Inside this campus, connecting the PCs, the laptops all together, we consider a local area network. Within a campus, within a building, a LAN, between buildings, between campuses, between cities, a wide area network. Different technologies are used and they have different requirements. A wide area network normally requires crossing public right of ways. What that means is that normally it needs to cross other people's land. Consider SIT wants to build their own network that connects the two campuses. That is, they want to lay a layer cable that goes from this campus across the ground to the Rungsit campus. To do that, they would need to get the permission of all the landowners in between the two campuses. That's complex. You need to go to everyone and get permissions to dig a hole in their ground, maybe under their building, to put the cable in. So normally it's not the end customers like SIT that do that. There are special companies that it's their business for building such networks. Telecommunication companies or common carriers. TOT, CAT and all the smaller internet service providers do this. They build wide area networks. And then what they do, they lay the cables, they get permissions to pass other people's land, and then they rent that wide area network to customers like SIT, to companies and to individuals. So a wide area network is normally operated by a telecommunications company who then rents that network to other users. SIT rents, can rent a network to connect the two campuses together. Pay some per month to carry our data across their network. Some of the questions we'll cover, and mainly after the midterm, is how do we find the best way through a network? I want to connect from my computer to a computer in the US. I can go via the Pacific, I can go via Europe and the Atlantic Ocean. There are many different paths. Which one's best? It's one thing we'll try and answer. How do we get the data across that network? We'll look at that. Some technologies which are used in wide area networks include asynchronous transfer mode, ATM, frame relay, SDH. We'll mention them later. That's a wide area network. A telecommunication company builds a network, usually across a city, between cities, and rents it out for others to use. A LAN covers inside a home, inside a building, across a campus. Usually owned and operated by the organisation owning the end devices. SIT owns all the PCs. SIT builds their own LAN inside this campus. They own the cables, they own the network devices, they operate the network, we, or we operate the network ourselves. We don't pay someone else to operate our LAN. We pay someone else to use their wide area network. As a result, there's different trade-offs in terms of the costs and, and what technologies to use. Some of the questions we'll answer, and again, it'll be after midterm. How do we arrange nodes in a LAN? I've said that this PC, or you can see, in fact, the PC has a cable coming out of it, a LAN cable, goes down, it goes into the, a socket in the wall here. You cannot see that. Same, this access point has a cable coming out of it, going to the ceiling, it goes somewhere. How do we arrange, where do they go to those cables? Do they go to one central device? Do they go to every other device, or what? That's something about the arrangement of nodes. Two technologies that you probably use on a regular basis, Ethernet, wired LANs, and wireless LAN, or Wi-Fi. Just two classifications of networks, WANs, and wide area networks, and local area networks. So, imagine now SIT has local area networks inside each campus. Tamasat also has LANs inside the different faculties across the Rungsit campus. They're all connected together. 
And then every other university has such networks and companies have that such networks and people at home. Then we connect them all together, all the lo local area networks and wide area networks, connect them all together and we get an internet. The internet is a collection of networks all connected together and all using one piece of software or one protocol called the internet protocol, IP. The idea is that even though the technology I use in my LAN may differ from the technology the Facebook web server uses in California, I have no idea what it uses, because they both support the internet protocol, they can talk to each other. So by all the devices supporting the internet protocol, then if they are connected to the same uh, connected to a network which leads to the destination, they can talk to each other, they can communicate. We'll cover again the internet uh, in, in some detail, including the origins or the history. That will be after the midterm. Let's give an, there are several examples here, uh, just example networks. I'm going to skip through those two and go to the example that uses SIT. It's a very simple view of SIT's network inside this campus. We can classify or we can group the LANs, the local area networks, based upon whether they are for a lab. Downstairs on the ground floor there's a, a lab LAN, 40 computers, all with cables connecting to a special device called a switch. All the faculty members in their offices have a computer. They have cables all connecting to some other switch. We have these access points. There are multiple access points across the campus. We connect wirelessly from our notebook or laptop to the access point. And then that access point has a cable to some switch. And similar, some of our servers, our web server, our database server, and so on, are just computers connected via LAN to a switch. In this simple case, we have four different LANs, local area networks. Then we connect them all together via other cables. And in this case, we're using special devices called routers. So the routers are connecting these LANs together. It doesn't have to be this way. It, it, it's similar to this in SIT. We can think of all of this diagram as the campus LAN. It's one big local area network. Anyone can communicate with anyone else inside this campus area network. So that's an example of uh, a LAN. Here's a router, some special device that connects to this LAN, which then connects onto this other router and so on. This we'll call our edge router or gateway router. It connects via two different links, this LAN to the outside world. That's it here. This cloud is used to represent all of this. So instead of drawing it again, I'll just use a cloud to represent an entire network or a LAN. And we focus on this router here. Our campus network connects via router via two different links. One is via a wireless link using a technology called WiMAX to the Rungsit campus. There's on the top of the other building there's an antenna, big antenna dish pointing to a building at Rungsit. We have a wireless link but directly between them, one wireless link. This cloud represents the LAN at Rungsit campus. And this is the, all the LANs at TU. All the different faculties have their own networks. They're all connected together. I'm not sure if we still do, but at least in the past we used to have a backup link. So we had our wireless link, and we had a second backup link. If that failed or something went wrong, we paid an internet service provider to use their network. So here's an internet service provider who has a network across Bangkok. We pay and use ADSL, some telephone line based technology, to connect to their network. 
and they are connected to other people's network and TU is connected to other people's network and all of those other people's network are included in this cloud, the rest of the internet. So that's a, a basic view of how we connect our LAN to the outside world. It can be more complex than this but just a, a simplified example. So we're going to cover how the communication links work. How do we get data as signals across links? That's the main focus up until the midterm. After the midterm, we'll focus on how do networks work? How do we build LANs? How do we build wide area networks? And then how does the internet work? What is the internet protocol? How does web browsing work? And, and similar applications. That's after the midterm. The last example, and you're going to look at that over the next week because I want to do something else before we finish in the last five minutes. This website has a map of the internet in Thailand. It's a complex picture. There's two pictures, in fact, a domestic map and an international map. Have a look at that. See if you can make any sense of it. Next week, we'll look at it in a bit more depth and explain some parts of it. But a map of the internet in Thailand can be found by the 